Cecil Global and African Diaspora News Channel presents the Ghana Luxury Property Tour. It will be a eight day tour coming to you starting October 1 through October 8, 2023. Now you enjoy a five-star stay at a hotel, the finest properties in Ghana. You connect with industry professionals. You will also visit cultural landmarks, have a meet and greet with the team and so much more. Make sure that you go to the description box below and hit that link to sign up. Well, hello there. How are you doing? Thank you for joining us again for another episode of our conversations and banters of living in Africa and life in Africa in general. My name is Zandero Ganga. I am a business journalist by profession and I'm also a digital content creator. And you can find my YouTube channel at Zandero Ganga where I create content on um, moving back to the continent. So travel, life and love stories of the diaspora community that have relocated back to Ghana sharing their real life experience, the ups, the downs, the journey of finding a home in Africa. So we can learn a lesson or two from each other and not make the same mistakes that they made, but at the same time build a community of like-minded people. Now, a lot has been happening on the African continent and a lot is always said about African leaders, but I feel like there are some who stand out and they have stood for the dignity of the African people and the African continent for a really, really long time. Now, when you think of African leaders that stand out in terms of development, career smart personality and just having um just having the 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 uh, can i say the word can i say it? the boss to to tell off the west then one of those leaders has to be Rwanda's president paul kagame i do not mean to say that kagame is a saint right but unless you're rwandese and you've lived in rwanda and you're speaking from a Rwandese point of view, then sometimes I feel like as outsiders, we are very keen to point out on all the things that are not working in a system and ignore how they got there or all the things that are working in the system. And I think President Kagame is one of those people who has been at the forefront saying, listen, you're not going to tell me how to be Rwandese, how to live as a Rwandese and how to govern the Rwandese people. The attitude of adult supervision has to be left in the past. Examples of right or wrong conduct can be found everywhere. We must avoid the temptation to reduce Africa to the lowest common denominator with blanket judgments and generalizations. There cannot be a mutual respectful partnership premised on the unspoken assumption that one party lacks values or has defective values while the other party is a fully formed moral agent. The complexity of politics, history and context and public opinion in every country requires a sensitive understanding and a willingness to genuinely listen, learn, and adapt. We are not talking about excusing wrongdoing or abusing the principle of sovereignty to evade responsibility. And there are some who do so. It is about dialogue, respect, and a commitment to the more robust partnership which both Africa and Europe need in order to prevail over the challenges of the 21st century together. For Africa, Europe is a partner of choice for many reasons. I believe that next year's summit is the right time to demonstrate the readiness for change and progress on both sides. This is a place where different voices from either side can be heard and factored into the thinking on the future of our nations. This includes some important perspectives that are rarely considered, which if I may, we'll get to in a moment. In Africa, we are engaging with Europe 
with a view toward taking the relationship to a higher level and making sure it is adapted to the times we live in today. For one thing, Africa has assets and the capabilities to offer to the partnership, both human and material. Let's not ask what can be done for Africa. The guiding question should be what can Europe and Africa do together for mutual benefit, which neither can accomplish alone. In line with what he was saying, I think also part of releasing Africa from the chokehold that the West has on it and part of respecting the continent is accepting that there is no monolithic way of, of looking at life, you know. Um, I think this is not something that has just happened to him. It happened to the previous two president, the president of Kenya, the previous president, Uhuru Kenyatta. Um, it has happened to President William Bruto, the president of Zambia. It has happened to the president of um, Liberia. Many at times when some of these leaders are in meetings with their um, European counterparts or Western counterparts, there's always this thing of values, values, values. and and. Um, I, sorry, not sorry, but the West thinks that um, what they consider as values is the blanket definition of values. And to some point, it makes sense, but um, this is who you are, this is what you believe in, and we're allowing you room to believe in what you believe in. Why can't you allow us to also be? The, the, the enforcement of European or Western values on Africa is almost in, in an effort to erase African values and African identity because um, Any time African leaders are in meetings, they ask of values, values this, values that. And I mean, the former president of Kenya categorically stated when Barack Obama visited Kenya that you have your values and as Kenyans we have our values. I think also President Ruto, when he was being interviewed by CNN, he said, listen, you have your values and we have our values. But let me tell you, President Kagame put a cap on it when the value question came. He said, listen, values are not just western even africans have their own values who defines the values or who doesn't actually have values when people talk about values sometimes this is one part of the world that has assumed the sole responsibility and the monopoly of defining values. So the rest of us have no values. We've just to keep learning from these ones who define the values. And, and by the way, the danger also is, it doesn't matter how you, long you take learning, you will never qualify. You will just always be branded somebody who has no values or who comes from a place where there are no values. So I want to put this case clear. Those from the north who always assume where BBC comes from, who always think they are the face of values, the rest how to follow. It's a big mistake, it's not true. We have values too, we here in Rwanda, in Africa, we do, no question about it. And you know what's very hypocritical about that values conversation is that it's always brought up when it serves the West. So when the West has an agenda that it's it's very keen on pushing, that values becomes like uh, 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 the center of every conversation and the goalpost keeps changing. Um, because a lot of donor money comes from the West, they control the agenda. For example, there was a time um, we were heavy on abstinence, then there was a time abortion was wrong and it just keeps changing. It keeps changing for as long as they control the donation bag then um, values are going to be dictated by them 
but it's very hypocritical because beneath the, the, the veil of value, there's a lot of darkness and murky stuff that goes on behind there that people do not necessarily talk about. People do not talk about the atrocities that the West committed in Africa. Where were those values during that time? Where were those values when the British were raping um, women in camps in Kenya? Where were those values when they were torturing people who refused to go to concentration camps? Where were those values in Namibia when there was a genocide? Where were those values um, when, 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 when the Belgium decided that um, they are going to split Rwanda into two? Some of these problems we have had in our continent, in Rwanda, Those from the north who define or want to define values have been part and parcel of these problems we have been facing. Some of them have actually been the cause of the problems we face. But at the same time, like, like the genocide here that, that took place here in Rwanda, where one million people over were killed. Well, I remember if your memory serves you well too, I'm not inventing anything. The debate that went on at the UN, it was like, you know, these uh, developed rich countries, those who define values, simply took it like these are just Africans killing each other. These debates were in the open. But you think that is true? You think the divide that actually led to this genocide was just the creation of Rwandans? Not the people from the north who actually divided this country? told the people to think of themselves as belonging to one ethnic group and the other to think as belonging to one another ethnic group and therefore they should kill each other. Not only are they different, but they should kill each other. Would you believe that? Would you tell me that the two, 20 million people, this is documented by other people, not by me, who were killed in the Congo, were killed by other Congolese in the old days of King Leopold. And you think all that just disappeared in a moment, then you had the savages coming over and taking over their own countries and killing each other, and then the others assume the higher ground, they are up there in the north and keep pointing fingers at those of us and think we have no values and we just uh, are there to, you know, we don't respect freedoms, we don't respect human rights, we, sure, do you think so? BBC, you think so? You take time, you broadcast and from morning to evening, you, this is literally just abusing people. You are abusing Rwandans, you are abusing Africans, you are values, values, values. What values do you know, my dear sister, on behalf of BBC? And so on, as far as I'm concerned, as I know, as far as Rwandans are concerned, we don't need any lessons from BBC or from anyone. I, I tell you this with firm conviction. Now, I know just like me, you might have questions about some of the things that happen in these countries. I mean, there have been countless documentaries that have been made documenting abuse, not just in, 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 in Rwanda, in Burundi, in like. I think that there are human rights violations in different kinds of countries. The magnitude might, might, might differ, the context might matter to some extent or not, but there has been some record of it. Now, if we are going to hold each other accountable on human rights violation, cut it across the board. There's no way that America will try to hold Africa on human rights violation, yet George Floyd 
died in the streets with a white police officer on a knee on his neck for over eight minutes begging for his life. You can't talk to me about human rights violation yet it's happening in your backyard. You cannot talk to me about human rights violation when, when, when Tyree Nichols just happened the other day. And I don't mean to equate the two to each other, but I'm saying look in your backyard instead of policing me on how to, 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 to up, up, uphold the rights of my people. Um, look, look in your backyard. It's, it's happening right in your backyard. And, and, it, and it's not unique. It's America has its challenges when it comes to human rights. It might not be in the same way that African countries do, but they have their challenges. The US has its challenges, the UK has its challenges, Canada has its challenges, Germany has, most of the China has its challenges with the concentration camps. Everybody has a, 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 an issue or a problem with human rights violation that they need to address. But when it comes to Africa, we make it, we, it's, it's like a noose we're hanging over Africans that, um, there's a lot of human rights violation happening there and President Kagame was very keen on saying, listen, I have lived half of my life fighting for freedom, fighting for the rights of my people. So who are you to lecture me on human rights? Half of my life, I've been living in the trenches, not sure of living to the next day. I didn't fight to be the president of my country. Never. It came by accident, I think. So I was fighting for my own rights, which anyone in any human rights organization could not give me. And even now cannot give me or cannot give Rwandans. So it's, it's, it's a cynical and absurd that anyone would just be there talking about the violations, you know, you, me as the leader of my own people, to be accused of violating their rights is, is just an absurd insult. But my answer is simple, is to do my best to serve my people the best way they can be served. That is the answer. Well, that's all I had for you on the Kagame roundup of him standing up against the West and some of the ideologists that they're always trying to push on Africa and telling Africans that they're not good enough at this or good enough at that, or telling African do it like this, but not like this, or you're not getting it. And I think that it's very important for African leaders to begin standing up for themselves because that is the only way that Africa is going to move forward. If we are led with leaders who are like toothless bulldog, they're never going to back. But if we are led by leaders who are willing to stand up and have a voice, then they're speaking for all Africans. And it doesn't mean that they can't get checked, but it means that our voices are going to be heard in these platforms and it's going to become like Africans matter. We are just not the other continent, but we are people. We are real people with leaders that know what they're talking about and they care about the welfare of their people and they will not be duped into any other thing that does not benefit their people. My name is Ndero Ganga. Um, I have a YouTube channel also. You can catch me there, Art and Dero Ganga, where we talk about diaspora relocating to Africa, sharing real life experiences of how the journey has been. I'll see you again next time.